All right, and now please welcome to the stage Stephen McHattie and Bruce McDonald. Hello. So is uh, Stephen around? Uh, he was. Oh, there he is. Yes. He was, he was. Uh, so keep the applause going for just another. Well, thank you guys again for coming out to the screening today. Uh, I'll just get things started on the q and I have one question for each of you, and then we'll turn to the audience and go from there. OK. Uh, so maybe I'll start with you, Bruce. Uh, so the novel that this is based on came out in around 1995, I think. The movie is 2009. There was simultaneously a radio play that you did with it. Can you talk just a bit about how the project evolved and how you got involved in the first place? Uh, yeah, the book came out yeah, around 95 or sometime in there, maybe a little bit later. Um, so I bought the rights to the book for a chocolate egg. <laughs> <coughs> I was on my way to, to, to the book release, and uh, I'd heard this was pretty good from the editor, and on the way I stopped at the corner store and bought a chocolate egg, the kind with the little stuff inside it, the little prizes. and. Uh, I used that to convince Tony that uh, I should option this book uh, and, you know, made it legal later. Um, but I was, very, I was very much attracted by the one sentence, which is the premise of the movie, which is the English language is infected by a virus. And uh, it's, a fa it's a very different, the movie is very different from the book. The book has uh, many other activities and things in it. Uh, and we were working away on the screenplay for some time, and it's, um, it's tricky because it's a tricky concept, and it took us down all kinds of different roads. And as we were working on the screenplay, we got a call from CBC Radio. Uh, they were looking for people to do radio plays outside of their usual uh, people, and uh, they asked us for some reason, and. Uh, I didn't really have a radio play sitting in the drawer, but uh, uh, at one point I thought, well, you know, Pontypool is about language and it's about this. So I talked to Tony about it and he said, well, why don't we, you know, stop what we're doing right now on the screenplay that we're w we were working on and we'll write a kind of a, v a version of it, but set in a radio station. And our inspiration was uh, the only other radio play that I really knew was Orson Welles' uh, War of the Worlds, which was kind of set in a radio station about an invasion of Martians. And so that became our sort of our template. And because it was a radio play set in a radio station, we contained the action to that place. And once the radio play was done, we thought, well, why don't we just shoot it? Because we had the script and that sort of thing. So uh, that, that was sort of the evolution of that. Um, um, and the script that we were working on uh, got finished finally about a year and a half ago. And uh, so that's, that's underway as well. <laughs> nice. uh, and Stephen, I wanted to ask you, the character that you're playing in this, uh, in some ways seems to be modeled on radio shock jocks, but then at other times is dropping references to fairly obscure French philosophers. Uh, was it tough to get a handle on who that character is? How did you start to get the sense of who Grant Massey is at his core? Uh, well, we went around to a bunch of radio stations in Toronto and yeah. Hamilton and just to see how they ran things, and I picked up little things from them. And um, I'd always been a, you know, I grew up in Nova Scotia, so I grew up on radio, not TV. So uh, I l listened to radio all the time, uh, so it seemed pretty easy. Okay, so it was a fairly natural thing to take on? Seemed to be, yeah. 
And are there any questions in the crowd? Uh, you there right in the middle? So uh, just to repeat the question, uh, the question is oh, about great, great. the framing decision uh, in one of the attacks is to focus right, on yeah. the poster rather than on the attack that's happening and what the reason was for that. Uh, well, it's, I guess at some point we looked at the sort of footage of like kicking the shit out of this little girl. <laughs> and we thought that maybe it was maybe not the thing to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, oh, there's uh, near the back in the middle? In, yeah. Well, it's funny, this, this uh, uh, sort of, <laughs> it was fun. I just came in the last few, few minutes and watched uh, the very, very end where we have Grant Mazzy and Sidney Breyer as sort of gangsters. That little, there was a big debate in when we were editing the movie where, like there was a big debate in how to finish the movie actually when we got to the end and it was, we kind of, the, the interesting thing about this movie, we shot it in chronological order, which is very unusual for a movie because most movies are shot, uh, you shoot all the scenes at the diner and then you shoot all the scenes that you shoot them in what is most convenient. But because this film was shot uh, in one place, it, we were able to shoot it uh, each day. We would shoot the next pages, and so by the time we got towards the end, we had an ending, but there was still there was still a fluidity to what it actually might be, and uh, there was quite a debate, maybe a debate between a fight between the actors, the writer. We were all fairly unified in our producers and. Uh, uh, we ended up first, you know, myself and Tony would bring things to Stephen and Lisa and say, what about this? What about this? And then Stephen, we finally brought one that he quite liked, which was the one you saw there at the very, very end after the credits. So in the cutting room, it was, do we, you know, do they kiss and then you go right to that? Or do you have the credits? And um, so all that to say, I'm very happy to still see that sitting in the movie. And it has weirdly given birth, you know, when, when I was talking to Tony the other day, we've come up with another, there's another movie that we're making in uh, October <coughs> called Dreamland. Uh, and it's kind of based on those two people, uh, strangely. And it's kind of fantastic, written by Tony. When we finished this movie, we had such uh, you know, a positive experience. It was very fun making it, it was very rewarding and we all had a nice time working together, and when you enjoy the company of the, your fellow you know, visual mechanics, you kind of want to keep going. So we thought uh, we would write something uh, that ended up being kind of about these two people. So we're shooting that in October. Uh, it's called Dreamland. Uh, and so in a weird way, it's a very, it's a, it's a kind of strange sequel to this movie. Uh, and of course, the, what I mentioned earlier about the script we've been working on for quite some time was finally finished. So that will be finally done uh, maybe late winter this year or the following year. Um, but it's basically what happens, uh, you know, in the town. And it's not, it's other characters. You hear the radio and blah, 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 but it's, uh, it's taking more things from the book. So yeah, uh, right up front here. So the question is, uh, any advice for aspiring directors? Uh, my advice for aspiring directors would get a good writer. <laughs> uh, and I say that because it's never been easier to make a movie um, with the amazing technology that we have now. Uh, you can make a movie on your phone uh, and it can look pretty good. And uh, I think more than ever, it's important to have like great material and great stories. And most directors are not very good writers. Um, and I don't mean to be negative, but it's, 
so I encourage uh, the ones that are good writers, well, keep on doing that because that's great, but I encourage, I would encourage them to seek out uh, a great story editor or a great story because in the end, it doesn't really matter if your movie is $100 million or you know, $10,000. It's really about the story and the characters. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah, right in the middle. <laughs> so uh, just to repeat the question. Honey, uh, honey was, the cat? Was Honey the Cat the poster in the book, and what did it mean? <laughs> hey, Steve, you can <laughs> get that one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> start. Uh, well, I think it's, um, you know, incorporating the problems of the town and the, you know, kind of the context of, where it's situated, you know, because Grant Massey is coming in from outside and really doesn't know how to interpret anything, and he's just kind of finding his way. Um, what's its significance? Um, things go missing, I guess. <laughs> yes, things go missing, and the book, it's probably a bit more uh, pointed in the book because in the book, the very first words to be infected were terms of endearment, like sugar, uh, sweetheart, honey, honey the cat. Uh, and from there, you know, the sort of verbal apocalypse uh, went down. And it's a kind of a small town thing. And... Uh, yeah, and he kind of explains it in this kind of Grant Massey way at the very top with the kind of crazy honey pot de flac uh, kind of strange tumbling word association um, cascading of logic and, and, and words. So yeah, uh, I, I, I can't actually remember if it was in the book, but uh, it's in the movie. <laughs> Uh, what was the thought process behind the color scheme? Uh, I really can't tell you. Um, at the moment, uh, the movie was uh, designed by Leah Carlson, who's a, a good designer, and uh, Miroslav Bazak, who is a photographer. Uh, I don't know. I guess it was, uh, you know, we were, I guess, when I think back, you know, this is a winter film. It's... Um, uh, sort of early morning, uh, it's inside. So maybe it was that sort of, that, 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 those chilly scenes of winter, or that kind of uh, cold, remote place. So, yeah. Um, wh wh how, what, it, what, what, it, what did those colors make you feel, I guess, when you, that you brought up the question? Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a real place in Ontario and in Wales. And the location that you shot on? The location is an old abandoned Korean church in the junction in Toronto. Um, I think they're about to tear it down, aren't they? Yeah, and uh, we... I always remember, I think, shooting it, because around 6 o'clock in the evening, the Korean choir would start up upstairs. Uh, wonderful people. Uh, not so good for, for recording sound. But, uh, yeah, so it was, the booth was built, like the, 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 the um, uh, radio booth. But as a place, yeah, that, that was a place that we found. And we thought that it was a good maybe representation of a uh, small town place and a kind of humbling place for the big city man, Grant Massey, to have dropped into uh, to make his uh, mighty fall complete. And that, unfortunately, is all that we have time for right now. But uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you guys for coming tonight. So, so, uh, so great. Thank yeah, you. And thanks again to Real Canada and to the Government of Canada for helping to make this happen. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all around at the rest of the festival. Thanks.